Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so you all know who I am and what I do. Uh, but for those of you who don't, um, I am the National Director of the Make Textbooks Affordable campaign for the Student Public Interest Research Groups, or Student PERGs. Um, we're a national nonprofit organization um, that works in uh, about 25 states on important issues to students as citizens. So the environment, consumer protection, government reform, and we've been working on these issues for about 35 years, and what makes us kind of unique is that we have chapters on 100 campuses across the country that have staff organizers that work with the students to train them on important campaign skills and to actually run campaigns that make an, an impact on, on the important issues. So um, I've been the director of our campaign for textbook affordability for about four years now. And um, when I started working on this issue, actually, um, OER in, in textbooks really wasn't um, considered a solution. And since then, it's really um, become our top priority. And um, it's been a pleasure to be part of this community. And I, I'm, I'm uh, excited to tell you a little bit um, about our work on affordable textbooks. But first, just a quick issue overview, looking at why we think open textbooks and OER are such a great solution. So um, I'm sure everybody in, in this room knows <laughs> that textbooks are expensive. Um, some of you may not know what current prices are. So this is the most widely used calculus textbook in the country, $224.95. Uh, economics, ironically, a lot of money. Um, chemistry, so major introductory subjects especially. Most textbooks will run at least 150, up to 250 dollars, and you know these are students who um, are already struggling to afford their education. As we heard yesterday, um, the amount of student debt held by Americans is actually larger than credit card debt, um, and uh, students are spending a lot of that money that they're spending on, on education on textbooks. The College Board estimates that. On average, students spend over $1,000 per year on their books. And when you look at that in, in the perspective of how much they're spending on tuition and um, other education expenses, it can be pretty significant, um, especially at community colleges, where um, in, in a lot of cases, I've talked to students who actually spend more on textbooks than they do to pay to take the class. Um, in states like California, the state auditor has released figures that show that students actually spend more on average on textbooks than, than their education. It's the single largest cost of attendance. Um, and then just even though we've, we've started to see um, a lot of cost saving measures coming out of the market, and I'll talk about those in a second, um, we have continued to see prices skyrocket. Um, four times the rate of inflation over the past two decades. Um, and uh, actually, this is random, but um, on Twitter there was a hashtag trending when I was 14. Um, and I ran a quick calculation on that and found that textbooks, since I was 14 years old, textbooks have actually more than doubled the prices. Um, so that is just crazy how fast prices are rising and it's, it's only getting worse. Um, so the organization I work for, the Student Perks, we've conducted um, some extensive research on this issue that dates back close to a decade, um, and released a number of reports that have just sort of exposed the underlying causes of high prices and why, why they're rising so quickly. Um, and uh, the main factors are, you know, these really, really expensive prices. Um, new additions that come out unnecessarily every few years. I'm sure anybody who's taught a class or perhaps has kids in college knows that uh, publishers often release new editions, um, even in subjects like calculus where the subject matter just doesn't change that much. Um, and the purpose of that is to wipe used books off the market so students have to buy the new editions. Um, since publishers depend on selling new books in order to make money, they don't make money off of used copies. Um, and, it's, and it's a tragedy, though, because you can get the old editions online dirt cheap. I mean, this is um, just one example of a calculus textbook. You can get it for $80 used. Sometimes you can get it even lower than that. Um, and then another tactic we've observed is bundling. So um, publishers will package textbooks with expensive CDs and passcodes and other supplements 
that um, aren't always necessary for the class and often are just sort of pitched to faculty as free add-ons. But what it actually does is it does drive up the cost because of the cost of developing these items. And then also it makes the books harder to sell back at the end of the semester, especially when there's like a passcode that expires. So even though the book is exactly the same, the bookstore can't buy the book back because it needs that passcode. Um, so students in the next semester are forced to buy new books. Um, and then just a lot of other tactics we've observed. Um, we found that publishers withhold information about textbook pricing from professors. We've passed some legislation to address that. Um, uh, overseas publishers will charge much lower prices, um, coming up with different ways to sabotage the used book market. Actually, customization is becoming one of the leading ways they do that. Um, even sometimes they'll just pitch you know, a custom cover book that's exactly the same but has a different cover and forces students to buy new books rather than getting used copies of the standard edition. Um, and then the other thing is the e-books that are out there right now, publishers have started to expand their digital offerings pretty rapidly. And when I say publishers here, I'm talking about you know, major publishers, the, the large companies that dominate the market. Um, conventional e-books um, are, are sold um, at a lower price, but they actually end up costing more um, because students can't sell them back at the end of the semester. Um, and then they expire, so they can't even keep them if they want. Um, and then the reason that um, kind of the core cause of all these problems is that there's what's called a market failure in the textbook market. Um, and you know, the way a normal market works is that you have two parties, a consumer and, and a producer, um, and they're kind of on even footing because the consumers have the right to put pressure on, on, on the producer to lower costs, and then the producer has to work hard to get the consumer's business. But in textbooks, it just doesn't work that way. You have three parties, the publishers who develop products for professors who choose them and assign them to the student, and then the student is stuck paying whatever the publisher is charging. And even though this is the way it should work, because professors are the ones that know best um, what materials will help educate their students, it still creates a flawed economic dynamic that allows publishers to really exploit students and charge such outrageous prices. And it's actually, there's another market out there that's Kind of similar to this. Uh, can anybody guess what it is? Healthcare. Healthcare. Prescription drugs really is the, the best example. Um, so you have the doctor who's um, the decision maker but doesn't have to buy the product himself. Um, but fortunately, uh, we've gotten to a point where even though prices are rising, there are a lot of ways for students to save money. I mean, buying used books in the bookstore, usually you can get a 25% discount, even more online. Um, and this is only expanded as uh, social networking and, and the internet have allowed students cross country and, and within their communities to find each other and trade books. Um, also renting, this is actually relatively um, new, not a new idea, but new, newly rolled out at campuses across the country. Just you know, five years ago, there was only a handful of colleges that offered, offered renting. But just recently, within the last year and a half, the major bookstore chains have rolled out um, rental programs on, uh, I think, 2,000 campuses across the country, which is great. Um, they don't rent all of the books, uh, all of the titles, but um, students can also rent online, which is uh, gives them a lot more options. And you know, students are used to buying the book and selling it back at the end of the semester, so renting makes a lot of sense for them if they're not planning on taking the class uh, class in the future. Um, E-books I mentioned, you know, they give a discount, 40 to 50 percent off, um, but uh, the unfortunate thing is most conventional ebooks do expire, usually after 180 days. So you're not actually buying something, you're only renting it. Um, and a lot of students don't realize that up front. And then also there are just some really silly restrictions on it to prevent piracy. Like you can't be logged in on more than two computers at once. You can't download it and store it on your computer for, for a long time. Um, and then just, you know, generally if you look at the, the terms and conditions, there's some pretty scary uh, threats that, <laughs> um, who knows if publishers will oh, actually act on them, but it can be scary to students. Um, and then also, uh, we're starting to see digital textbooks for e-readers taking off, um, and this has expanded pretty rapidly. Um, and we're going to delve in a little bit more into this in the next session, if you're going to stick around. Um, but uh, yeah, with like iPad and Kindle and, and all of the different e-reading devices that are out here, it creates a lot of potential. However, just like the e-books, the content is really expensive. And on top of that, you need to buy a special device. So 
Um, there's some challenges there for reducing costs. Um, and then, so we did kind of a, uh, an analysis across all of these different options just to figure out if, if every student who, um, or I guess this is just comparing how much students can save money on, on each of them. Um, but we, we did a, a survey of students to figure out kind of where they're at on, on their preferences, what they want to buy, what they want to rent, and how they feel about printing digital. Um, interestingly enough, we found that about three quarters of students, despite the fact that they're on Facebook and Twitter and, and do everything online, um, they still prefer print books. And um, I think the limits on, on e-books is one part of that. And then also students just sort of grew up with print books. So I guess it's not too surprising um, that they would prefer that. Um, and then also uh, that most students actually still want to keep their books, um, or at least have the option to keep their books. So renting can't be a complete solution. Um, and then just putting those things together, uh, we found that every student who could take advantage of each one of these options, or every student who wanted to take advantage of one of these options actually did, this is the maximum amount of savings that each option could provide for the market. So the largest one renting um, is 33%, so it could reduce costs 33% of where we are now, which is still not affordable. That's taking a, a $200 textbook and reducing it to $166, which is not affordable. So we need a better solution. Um, we know that we can do better than that, and that's where open textbooks come in. So we all know what open textbooks are. They're just like a traditional textbook, except they have an open license. Um, and they're better. They're free online and affordable. You can get hard copies um, at a low cost, and they have all the benefits of an open license flexibility. Um, the ability to share and the ability of instructors to actually adapt the text to better fit their class. Um, and open textbooks have been adopted, um, actually it's, it's up over 3,000 classes now across the country, which is really great progress, and they're used at some really top-notch institutions, Harvard, Caltech, Berkeley, like the college, like the top colleges in the country are already using open textbooks. Um, and then we've seen uh, just new models developing, and, and many people in this room are, are part of that, of uh, coming up with ways that, that open textbooks can be sustainable in the long run. Um, so here are just two examples of, of what open textbooks are. This is a linear algebra textbook. Um, it comes HTML, PDF, EPUB, black and white book. You can print it yourself. Um, and then there are all those varying costs. And then this is one of the books published by Flat World Knowledge. Uh, the leading commercial publisher of open textbooks, um, which also gives students a, a variety of options that they can take advantage of. Um, and then the thing about um, open textbooks that we really believe is, is the key is that it actually solves this problem. So this ebooks and rentals and all those other solutions, they still perpetuate this old broken market because they're not actually changing the way that students buy their products and the way the dynamic between publishers and students. But open textbooks actually do that. Um, it, it splits the textbook up essentially into content and, and, and products. Um, so the publisher is going to market the content to the professor because that's what matters to the professor. And then it's going to market the different products around the open textbook to the student because that's what matters to the student. Um, and by splitting those two things up, it actually fixes the broken dynamic because it opens up a two-way street between publishers and students. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm sure any of you who are familiar with our campaign, we give a lot of publicity to Flat World Knowledge um, and as a consumer advocacy organization. We very rarely give um, for-profit companies that kind of credit, but we feel comfortable doing that with Flat World Knowledge because we know because those books have an open license, there's always going to be the ability students have to um, uh, keep them in check. They can't rip students off because if they start charging too much for their textbooks, students are just going to use the free version. Um, so it creates the healthy dynamic that we want to perpetuate in the textbook market. Um, and, and we want to expand the market to include more options like this. Um, then the other part of open textbooks that we really believe is, is the key um, to see is the overall savings. I mean, it's obviously dramatic. Um, so just compared to the other options that I was talking about before, open textbooks will reduce costs 80% on average. Um, some people have asked, well, why isn't 100%? Um, but the other 20% is actually spent on the optional products. So not all students are going to want to use it free online. Um, in fact, our research shows that given the option between a free online version and the low-cost print version, 
60% of students would want to buy the, the print version, and, and flat world knowledge's sales statistics are um, somewhat back that up. Um, so uh, just to um, put that in perspective, so um, it works out to save students about $100 if their professor switches from a traditional textbook to an open textbook. Um, the amount they'd be spending on, on a traditional textbook versus the open textbook. Um, and so $100 in savings per student. That means in um, the 100 student class, it would be, oh, got an extra zero in there. Um, oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, okay, so $10,000 for a 100 student class, five classes at a university, that's $50,000, and two semesters a year, that's $100,000. So one professor, one department switching one class to an open textbook yields $100,000 per year in savings for students, which is tremendous. Can I just check, that's $100 per student per class? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like 107, but... For this, I'm rounding it off. Um, so just the potential savings are huge. There are, um, what, 5,000 educational institutions in the United States. Multiply that by, well, what is that? 500,000? Yeah. 500 million, is that possible? It's a lot of money. Um, so uh, that kind of concludes the issue background portion of this presentation. Now I want to tell you guys a little bit about the campaign um, that we've been running for the past eight years. Um, so uh, the campaign is called Make Textbooks Affordable. And um, uh, it's important to point out that it's not make textbooks free. So while we believe that textbooks have the potential to be free, um, we want to embrace all the solutions that are out there. So we started out, um, our first main strategy was exposing the problem. So publishers, obviously, the, the root of the problem, um, they are publicly traded companies. Their public in, in, image actually matters. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of mileage out of just exposing them in the national media and um, just educating the public about the kind of um, just tactics they're using to rip off students. And um, our research has generated a lot of media attention, and then also um, sparked a congressional investigation back in 2004 um, that resulted in a GAO report released in 2005. Um, we've also uh, worked to organize professors across the country to uh, implement ways to reduce costs. I mean, professors are the ones that choose textbooks, so they're in the, the best position to reduce costs. So even just um, adopting guidelines for adoption that um, limit the high prices and, and negotiating with publishers and it can actually have a, a really really big impact and we've also organized about 3,000 professors to sign on to a statement saying they'd be willing to consider using open textbooks when appropriate for their class and that's really helped build credibility for the entire open textbook movement um, I, I alluded to before we've also passed a law um, through uh, Congress that requires textbook publishers to disclose the price of textbooks when they're marketing books to professors. And um, it went into effect on July 1st of last year. And um, so far, implementation hasn't been as strong as we would like. Um, and we're planning on taking action this year to investigate just how much they're disclosing their prices and <laughs> um, suggest some best, better practices for doing that. Um, but it, it at least uh, provided some sunshine and exposed uh, one of the worst publisher practices our research has found. Um, and then also just working to promote open textbooks, we've been using our students on our 100 campus chapters across the country to just get the word out to faculty, let them know that these options are out there, um, presenting to departments and, and actually just going person to person. Students can reach professors in a way that, that really um, nobody else can because they're the affected party. And any professor in the room knows that your students <laughs> Um, I, are, are complaining a lot and uh, taking that to the next level and actually providing information about solutions can be really powerful. Um, and then the most recent effort that we've been involved with is the textbook rebellion. And I think um, many of you have <laughs> heard about our national tour and our mascots. Um, and the textbook rebellion is actually a national coalition. What we've realized is that this problem has actually gone beyond just students. 
we've been running this campaign for close to a decade, but really it's, it's not just about students anymore. Faculty are being affected. They're forced to teach more and more students who haven't purchased their textbooks because the cost is too high. Um, parents are having to spend extra money to, to buy books for their students. And um, even uh, taxpayers, I mean, we heard this morning, we spend millions of dollars through our, our, our taxes paying for textbooks. So really what we need is to organize a united front across all constituencies affected by this issue. Um, and that's kind of the idea behind the textbook rebellion. And um, so far the coalition includes us, a, a number of student organizations and student governments. Um, Flat World Knowledge is part of it and a couple of other open textbook and affordable textbook publishers are part of it too. <laughs> so um, the, uh, we're hoping to build that out in, in the coming months and I hope that I can start <coughs> conversations with a lot of you here about being part of that too. Um, and then I just quickly want to show you, oh my goodness, well I can go with this, our national tour. These are our mascots. We went on a tour across the country, stopping at 40 campuses, starting in August. Um, are you going to go? There we go. That was our So those are the textbook rebellion mascots. <laughs> um, literally, we had a van, and we put those mascots in a van, and we drove them to 40 campuses across the country over the course of six weeks. We gathered 10,000 petition signatures. Um, we uh, generated over 100 unique media hits, so articles, TV stations that were syndicated. <coughs> we estimate to about 300 different outlets, but we're still just tallying that all up. So it was just a huge... Um, a huge success. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think that, oh, yeah. So, uh, I want to make sure that we have a couple of minutes for questions, so just quickly, um, to run through what you guys can do to be part of the movement for affordable textbooks and the textbook rebellion. Um, I mean, faculty obviously adopt open textbooks um, when you can, and just consider the options and let your colleagues know. Students, we provide a ton of resources on our website um, to help you run campaigns, to educate your professors, and, and pressure your decision makers. Um, colleges can help support their faculty to both write and adopt open textbooks, and authors can put pressure on, on, on their publishers to allow them to publish open textbooks and start adopting business models that make more sense. So, um, I'm going to stop there and see if anybody has any questions. I think we have um, four minutes left. No, five, three. Besides Flat World Knowledge, who do you say are the major publishers who are publishing open textbooks that are helping in this movement? So Flat World Knowledge is by far away the largest. Um, but there are also a couple of smaller efforts. We work with one company out of Cambridge, Massachusetts um, called the Worldwide Center of Math. They're offering, um, uh, I think their goal is to get to 10 open textbooks in math. Um, they're using a no-derivatives license, though, so they're not um, as open as um, some of the other open textbooks out there, but as far as students are concerned, they're just as affordable. Um, and then uh, a lot of the efforts that we've heard about here, so CK12 um, offers a lot of open textbooks that are geared more towards high schools, but there's a lot of over overlap with community colleges. Um, and then, yeah, the Sailor Foundation, the Next Generation Learning Challenge is creating a bunch. Um, so there are a lot of different organizations. Um, but, and, that, and but that are currently being used right now in classrooms far away at Flat World. Like, yeah. What, what are the others that are currently being used in college classrooms? Um, by like what organizations? Correct. Okay, so yeah, the Worldwide Center of Mathematics offers That's textbooks right that are being used. Um, CK12 obviously has been adopted. In fact, I think we have an adopter of that in the room, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. So there you are. <laughs> um, and there also are a variety of, of open textbooks that actually um, aren't published by a, a pu traditional publisher or like publishing company that are just offered by individual authors. Um, or sponsored by departments that have gained a lot of visibility. There's a huge effort out of Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and then a professor at the University of Puget Sound who's published two books. You can look at uh, collegeopentextbooks.org. 
Yeah, there's information there. There's also information on our website. Um, we offer a catalog of open textbooks that are m most widely used. Uh, all the way in the back. Well, I just I kind of want to make a comment. I'm, I'm, yeah. uh, I've developed an open textbook called Writing Commons for composition. So I'm clearly behind this movement. I also direct a large writing program. I'm looking at 10,000 kids at a time. You know, each year, each year is over. And I just want to say that I, I have developed over the years a great deal of respect for the publishers. Yeah, I mean, I am doing an open, an open, an OER project. But I think, it, I mean, the system is a little broken. I, I agree. But it, it's really complicated. Because I've also written textbooks. Um, and the deal is, you know, you, yeah, okay, I will respond. First, I want to say that the production of textbooks written by faculty is not part of the faculty member's job, typically. <laughs> because you're not going to get tenure, you're not going to get uh, any kind of reward, because it's that's not the reward structure for the scholarship, theory, research. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it's, it's, it's you know, fair to say that, uh, you know, all, all the faculty should, I, I mean, I'm in support of this movement. I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of in a contrary position, but I just want to say that I don't think that the publishers are, are necessarily our, 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 our enemy. I think they're looking for a new business model, but uh, they are, they're uh, helping develop uh, new resources that, uh, mm -hmm. and their problem is, you know, after three years, it goes to the, uh, it, 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 well, after the first year, they lose half their money because it's going to the bookstore that's getting a 30% and the used book market is 50%. Right. So it's just, it is a broken system, but I just, yeah. I don't have any publishers here, but I, I've got a lot of respect for the publishers. And I, I, okay, I, I, so I, I, publishers, I publishers offer a valuable contribution. No, they, yeah, they really do. Nobody's arguing that. All right. But there's no excuse. <laughs> there, there's, we shouldn't tolerate the it's high prices. Like, it doesn't make it okay. But also, you have a short window of covering your development costs. I mean, I'm, 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 But it I'm doesn't have to be that way. They're, per, they're using a business model that fundamentally doesn't make sense. And it's costing students money. But it's a flat world of the writer. Yeah, I, but I think we can all agree that this is a complicated issue. I think that's right. And I'm glad that you, you brought this up because it is true. We do tend to demonize the publishers because our role in all of this is to build pressure on them to actually make that leap and start using business models that make a lot more sense. So, um, I mean, I, I appreciate the comment, for sure. Um, but, do we need to stop? Down? One more, okay. Well, I think here, if anyone, if anyone knows, like, is Flatworld published, how much a professor makes from their fees? Come to the next session. Okay. Your question. <laughs> I'm just going to say that I think what might end up happening is rather than seeing a change to an open model, the pressure that's being applied to publishers might be that they make incremental changes. Mm -hmm. So they start paying people for journal articles, for example, or for refereeing journal papers. So they might move a bit. I think if they move a bit, they could get a lot of people on board who are not currently on board. So mm -hmm. it seems to me that's the sort of danger for you because if publishers do shift a bit, the, the sort of leverage that you've got changes because you, they can get academics on side because all of a sudden they've got more self-interest. Well, if the model shifts in a direction that makes textbooks more affordable, that's progress. Well, right? you need not. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> because it could be just that rather than the, the profit going to the publishers, it gets spread around the academics who produce the materials as well. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the academics are not so bothered. I see. Um, well, it's always going to be a smaller proportion of authors to, or unless everybody offers their own. Yeah. Um, certainly there are ways it could go that would be disadvantageous for students, but I think that right now the way things are looking is we just keep on the publishers to come up with business models that are better for everybody. Okay, so I think that concludes the first session and we're now transitioning to the next session.